Welcome to Theory of Pets. I'm a passionate pet owner with a drive to help others like me uncover the truth about the pet industry and what goes on behind the scenes. All right. So today we are talking with Janet at Love and Bowl. Uh, she's a business owner here locally in my area. Uh, she makes homemade cooked dog food for dogs. Today, we're going to be talking about a couple of things as far as how she's gotten into her business and just uh, the start of it, what her passion is now and what her goal is ultimately and, and some other information as far as that she can pass on to our audience here. As far as the commercial dry dog food industry and what all pet owners should know if they are going to buy dry dog food and or wet dog food and um, all that good stuff. So thanks for joining me today, Janet. Hi, How are Connor. You? <laughs> I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. Doing great. I'm excited. I'm excited to get into this. I'm excited for us to have this chat. Just talking to you off uh, off air. It's been exciting just to learn from you and hear more about your business and um, how our, our views align and how we can, uh, you know, help pass this information along to uh, our listeners. So why don't we start at the beginning? Let's say you're 10 years old. What is 10 year old Janet doing? Did you have pets? And was there anything that happened that inspired you to do this or cook for your dogs? Um, 10 year old Janet was obsessed with horses. <laughs> I, every spare minute I lived at the barn, I had two horses and I was one of the horse crazy kids, the horse crazy girls. <laughs> I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon for sport horses forever. Wow. And I didn't have any dogs. My mother was terrified of dogs, but I had cats, birds, fish, gerbils, hamsters, you know, whatever I could sneak in the house, my, you know, and my parents let me keep. But I obviously did not complete vet school. I didn't go to vet school. I completed college, got married, had kids, got into accounting and finance. But the kind of medical side of animal care and then the nutrition was, it was always an interest to me. Got it. Well, I, that's, uh, I definitely knew uh, a bunch of people in middle school who loved horses. So, oh, yeah. But I don't know. They, they definitely I don't know if they were the type that would bring home. Like you said, you had a bunch of different pets. Yeah. But uh, that's awesome. OK, so you said the medical side is kind of what interested you as far as nutrition for dogs. Yes. Why don't you go ahead and tell us how uh, you got interested in making dog food for your dogs specifically yep. and then ultimately what launched uh, your business Love and Bowl? So um, I have, uh, since I moved out of my parents' house, I have been able to have dogs and I've always had a lot of dogs, mm -hmm. three, four, five, six at a time, um, mostly big dogs, like 100 pounds and up. So I currently have a 135 pound Rhodesian Ridgeback. And many years wow. ago, he had what I would have called then just an iffy stomach. Some mm -hmm. things he ate was fine. Some things he ate didn't go so well. And it got to a point that I started cooking for him and all of my other dogs. And it was a whole process. Um, I think I had four or 500 pounds of dogs at the time. I got serious about it. I talked to a lot of veterinarians. I consulted with veterinary nutritionists. And after a year of trial and error with my dogs as my test subjects, I developed what I consider my core diets. And then neighbors and friends started asking me to cook for them and a business was born. It quickly outgrew my home kitchen quickly. And uh, I opened up a commercial spot, I think six, six years ago now. And wow. it has grown every single year. It's been, it's been a wonderful process. That's awesome. And you also told me off air that you have a Mastiff as well, and he's 15. Yep. Um, yep. It's a female and she oh. is 15. Yep. yep. And she has uh, really no health issues. She's getting slower. Her, mm -hmm. she's losing some vision and some hearing, but you know, the vets tell me that she's in wonderful shape for a 15 year old, 120 pound dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I actually, uh, I did some research as far as the average age, at least from what Google told me, yep. is the average age for a Mastiff is between 6 and 12. Yep. So that's pretty impressive. Yep. Um, so what, I guess you, I know you touched on just you said pl you played around with some recipes trying to figure out what works for your Rhodesian Ridgeback. Is that what yep. you said? Yep. 
Yep. And why did you decide? And, and what are those those core recipes? And and why did you choose those? I make beef, chicken, lamb, and salmon based foods. Mm-hmm. And I chose them initially because they were easy for me to get the proteins. Okay. And they were the most um, re well not reliable, the easiest for me to get, the easiest to get testing on, and analysis on, and um, the proteins that people knew the most about. Some of the different proteins, kangaroo, rabbit. I have made them for special diets for special customers or different customers that wanted something outside of the realm of what I cooked. Mm-hmm. But it's um, consistency, basically, I would say. It's, it's a beef, chicken, lamb, and salmon are all very, they're easy to get. And the consistency mm-hmm. of what I buy is predictable. Now, I, I mean, I've seen in, in the commercial dog food industry, I've seen some, you know, kangaroo recipes. I think it's more of one of those one-off unique brands. Yep. Um, how, <laughs> I guess I, I'm very unfamiliar with the process of obtaining this kind of meat. What is that like trying to obtain kangaroo? What is that? like? Most where do it, you get it? Most of it's coming in from Australia. Okay. Although, and the, um, import restrictions around kangaroo is crazy. Um, Mm. My understanding is that there are some U.S. suppliers, Mm -hmm. but not many. And the demand outseat, you know, the demand exceeds what they can supply. Mm. So there was a ban on importing kangaroo for months and months and months and months and months. Do you do you know particularly why there was a ban or why it's so hard to get kangaroo in the U.S.? I don't know. That's interesting. I, I knew at the time, but I forgot that was several years ago. Do you think it may have something to do with like contamination They'd, since it's just or, or what do you think? I mean, that's interesting. Uh, I honestly don't know. It may have been contamination at one point. It also mm-hmm. may have been politics or uh, <laughs> I, import and trade agreements or, yeah. you know, or anything like that's that. That's a good point. That's a good point. I definitely it, it's probably the latter just because I know we have <laughs> we get right. It is we difficult. Get, yeah, well, but then we also, if it was contamination, then why do we just willy nilly get imports from China and right. stuff like that? Uh, um, very good point. <laughs> yes. Um. So <clears throat> you uh you touched on this with me. Um. So pet owners don't realize the detriment, or or maybe the detriment there is now as far as pet store dog food. Yep. Um. Why don't you talk about what you learned? about commercial dry dog food um, for those who are not aware and they're yeah. just feeding their dog iams or eucaneba yep. Um, yep. or purina or yep. whatever else is on the shelf um, mm-hmm. the commercial dog food industry is just by the regulatory environment surrounding it um, able to put things in their dog food that are detrimental to a dog's health mm-hmm. Basically, what goes into the commercial pet food is what doesn't go into any other food supply chain. It's the leavings of a granary floor, what is left over once the wheat and corn and soy is processed. You can put old moldy vegetables in dog food. You can put what's called the four Ds, dead, diseased, decayed, forgot the other D. Mm. Um but the four D's and they mm-hmm. can and do put that into dog food and it's, it's really sub optimal ingredients. Mm-hmm. And then usually the kibble process, they make it by the ton. Mm-hmm. They put a lot of, and legally can put a lot of chemicals, additives, preservatives mm-hmm. that are carcinogenic and banned in most other countries in the world. They put that into kibble and then they use an extrusion process, mm-hmm. which is high heat and high pressure that totally nukes the food and takes 50% of the nutrition out. Then they have to spray it with a flavored oil to get the dogs to eat it. Mm -hmm. And it is shelf stable for years. I call it Jetson food. It's, you know, from, from the Jetsons (laughs) cartoon, you know, it is, um, it will keep them alive. There is some testing around it. So it's not going to kill the dog, but Mm -hmm. as far as optimal nutrition, it doesn't exist in most commercial dry dog foods. That's interesting. I, you know, um, and this isn't some information that you've, I mean, this is information that has been kind of circulating, but you also, you know, 
uh, you know someone personally oh, yeah. um, that had this person uh, used to pick up the food. Um, the, the, yep. The, yep. Um, some slaughterhouses uh, will dump whatever they can't use in another manner. They put mm -hmm. it in a dumpster outside their um, slaughtering facility and pet food companies routinely come by with almost like a garbage truck and upend the dumpster that's been sitting out there for days, mm -hmm. a week or more. And that's what is rendered into dog food. You can also, also have euthanized animals. Wow. Horses, cattle, and our own pets can be euthanized and put into dog food. Wow. Yeah, that's incredible. Uh, that's... Incredible. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty interesting. And, um, you know, at least from my own little bit of education, I definitely know that they for sure put oils and trying to make it more palatable sure. for the dog. Spray but on oil. but yep. the goal is to make it this <clears throat> scalable, sterile food so they can basically mass produce right at scale, but also not get in trouble for contamination. Right. Um, so our YouTuber, Samantha she's actually had issues with commercial dog food prior to her homemade cooked food that she makes for her dog as well. Um, now I wanted to ask you about your position or your thoughts on raw dog food. Um, and why you believe what you leave, believe on raw dog food. Cause a lot of people, you know, there there's homemade cooked and then there's raw and people are like, raw is the best. So I just want to, I want to hear, I want to hear from you. You know, someone who's been sure. making food for your dogs. Well, I think there are pros and cons to both cooked and raw. Mm -hmm. um, raw food is uh, readily obtainable. My uh, hesitation about raw food is a contamination possibility of bringing mm -hmm. uh, raw meat into the home environment where it could possibly contaminate the, um, the people living in the house. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the, um, the cooked food takes care of all of that issue. It, it solves that um, salmonella E. coli issue. And mm -hmm. by, statistically, almost all raw food has um, E. coli contamination. And that's just not something that I wanted to be responsible for or liable for. Although I do deal with literally tons of raw meat. I'm in a commercial kitchen environment and we are, um, you can eat off our floors. It's super sanitary, super <laughs> clean, but not everyone is like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I have, um, I have thought though of opening a raw food line mm. and um, I may yet do that. I just haven't gotten to that point yet. Oh, cool. That's yep. awesome. It, it's, it has, <clears throat> has a lot of value. Yeah. So that, that may be down the road for us as well. Okay, cool. That's awesome. Yep. So outside of larger servings, you know, since your dogs are a Rhodesian Ridgeback and a Mastiff, yep. um, have there been any, any <clears throat> adjustments to um, what you've had to make as far as diet requirements for these two dogs that, that you own that are the, since they're a lot bigger, is it like more protein? Um, and less carbs. Cause I know as a Mastiff and Rhodesian Ridgeback, they have different calorie requirements compared to a yep. smaller dog. I also have a Havanese that ah. is a whole bounce in 15 pounds. <laughs> so I have everything here. And honestly, my dogs all eat the same diets and okay. I routinely change up their proteins. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that has a great value for their gut health, but that mm -hmm. we can get into that in a separate topic. Yeah. Um, I really didn't have to make too many changes. My big dogs are, uh, couch potatoes mm -hmm. and, um, I do think they, I, I think healthy carbohydrates are important. I think mm -hmm. filler carbohydrates and cereal type products are, are not healthy, hmm. but, um, yeah. So other than the fact that big dogs per pound use fewer calories than small dogs, that's really the only thing that you have to, to me in my research really have to consider hmm. for most of our dogs. These are general statements mm -hmm. and they're not facts for every dog that walks the earth, but yeah. 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 I guess, uh, you know, each dog, depending on the breed and depending <sighs> on their lifestyle, yep. they need different requirements, uh, which kind of leads me to 
my next question, because there's, you know, there's this giant debate about protein requirements oh, and, yes. and how yes. much they need to, they need to get as close as they can to 40%. And, you know, I personally, you know, use your dog food and I know there's quinoa in there or there's yep. rice. Um, yep. So I guess talk a little bit about that and the protein requirements and why you put carbohydrates yep. versus those, you know, those people who are like raw needs to be all protein and they get their vegetables from the animals that they eat. And that's all they need. I will say that there are raging debates in the dog nutrition community. It's, it's like a religion. It's the same thing as vegan carnivore. Yeah. And politics. And <laughs> when, when I started this whole process years ago, probably eight years ago now. Mm -hmm. um, it astounded me how little we know about dog nutrition. And even among experts, the opinions vary. I happen to believe that most of our dogs are pets. Most of them are very moderately or low activity level. And mm -hmm. I personally think that dogs need give or take 20 to 23% protein give mm -hmm. or take. Okay. If they are active, they're working dogs, they're hunting dogs, they're pulling sleds, they're on search and rescue, or they're running five miles with their owners every morning or on hiking trails, mm -hmm. then their diet requirements change. Mm -hmm. But I think most dogs don't need that 40% protein. Mm -hmm. And I think some people like to feed their dogs like they're triathletes, or weightlifters, and they're not that's me. <laughs> well, but you All know, my dog I mean, to be jacked. <laughs> well, but and and that's great if you balance the exercise side of it and the activity side of it with all the protein you're feeding. That that's yep. that's that's fine. Mm -hmm. But most people don't. Right. I mean, I don't. You know, my my dogs go for you know a brisk you know, three or four mile walk a day, mm -hmm. and that's really honestly about it. Mm. You know, the day in day out. And I also know that as dogs get older, their systems begin to fail mm. and high protein levels tend to be very hard on the kidneys because high protein, if it's not utilized, throws off nitrogen waste mm -hmm. and that nitrogen waste is filtered by the kidneys. So if they are eating more protein than they're utilizing, it's really a detriment to them. Mm. And that kind of segues into another topic that is a favorite of mine, and that's the quality of the protein you use. Mm. Yeah, why don't you we know, go ahead? Why don't we go ahead and talk about that? So uh, most commercial dog foods use things that aren't used in any other food chain, in any other food supply. So you'll get beaks, head, you know, skulls, wing tips, um, fish heads, fish tails, mm. and it may they may test the same in a laboratory environment. It may be the same protein percentage, but it is simply not metabolized the same as flesh, as mm. muscle tissue. Right. Um, the bioavailability of nutrients, that's probably one of the biggest buzzwords in the nutrition community. Doesn't matter if you're feeding dogs or people. Yeah. You know, yeah. if you if you're feeding kibble, your dog has to work harder to get those nutrients out. And if that kibble is made with subpar ingredients, then they're not getting those nutrients out. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the the basis of all of my diets is the best quality ingredients that you can buy is what you should be feeding yourself and your dog. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely um, what you uh, what you just said about the, um, you know, how your dogs aren't absorbing the amount that they should be from kibble diet definitely right. uh have learned there's all these different little tricks that the companies use to really try and skim out on protein um on nutrients and all that stuff it's just that that's definitely a diff totally different topic uh whole that could be a whole separate podcast that could the <laughs> um and the dilated cardiomyopathy the dcm the mm -hmm. the whole um the fda warning that came out several years ago mm -hmm. about dilated cardiomyopathy and grain-free diets mm -hmm. had nothing to do with grains it had to do with the reduction of the meat protein in the foods. 
They supplemented pea protein. Peas mm-hmm. don't have any taurine. Oh, I didn't dilated know. I didn't even think about that. Dilated cardiomyopathy is directly related to a taurine deficiency. So mm-hmm. if a nutritionist in a, a lab is saying, okay, well, we're taking out grains. So now there's too much meat. Mm-hmm. And too much protein for our balance. So let's take, let's, uh, let's put some peas in there, right? Mm, yeah. Peas have mm-hmm. carbohydrates, peas have protein. So let's reduce our meat. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a cheaper, cheaper, it's, it's a, cheaper to get. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's that, you know, it's the balance. It's the amino acids that the proteins provide. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, taurine is available only in flesh. Yeah. Yeah. Beans have protein. Garbanzo beans have protein. Lentils have protein, but they don't have taurine. Mm. So anyway. Yeah. Yeah. No. It's it's definitely. And then you'll get. <laughs> I I went ahead and did a little bit of my own research as well when I was, um, you know, because we we do have a website, and so sure. I'm trying to put together. I'm trying to put together articles that um, you know, are actually in the best interest because not everyone can afford raw, and right. also and homemade cooked food, yep. unless you know what you're doing is also, uh, it's not, it's not an easy undertaking. So, but I was going to say, as I, uh, I, you're able to find, there's this whole group of people that are basically what you and I are saying. And then there's these veterinarians who like, I would say, for example, I, I the, the specific example I'm talking about is I was looking for soy and soybean, I think. And if soy or soybean was healthy, and they on Google, it says generally safe. And then you go to who the uh, who said that. And then if you go to the article, it's a veterinarian. And then you go and you look the veterinarian up and it turns out they were they're with Wasava. <laughs> and then if you <laughs> go to Wasava right. and you look at their sponsors, it's Purina Institute. Right. Hills. So it's just it's it's uh, yeah. But then but Google was like, you know, they they're pushing that narrative yep. so it's just interesting yeah soy may be generally safe for dogs to consume that mm-hmm. may be a very blanket statement it may yeah. be generally safe yeah yeah it doesn't mean it's a quality protein that right. animals right that that would mean. thrive on yeah. i mean i think we all want our dogs and ourselves to have the best quality of life mm-hmm. and the best quality of life is to me life without pain Mm -hmm. And without encumbrances that you can solve yourself, if you can (laughs) eat well and exercise well and drink the proper amount of water, you're going to be a healthy person. Yeah. Yep. And the same goes. It's the same for dogs. Just feed them well. Exactly. Take the time. You know, I also think that kibble is uh, there. It's manufactured for the ease of humans, Mm -hmm. not for the nutritional benefit of dogs. Right. Try it. They try. They basically it's the same thing as as if you they want to make it affordable to them and affordable to us. Right. You know, because otherwise you are if you're if you know how to shop for homemade dog food Mm -hmm. for yourself, you are basically getting food for another person, Um, a smaller person. Fortunately, sometimes <laughs> depends, <laughs> depends. Most of the time, so it depends right. on the dog. Right. I've never had a 135 pound <sighs> dog. That's wow. I, I want it. I think like in my mind, I wanted one, you know, cause like they're just, they're badass looking. Yeah, they are. <laughs> my, my guy was, uh, you know, he's older now, so he slowed down a bit, mm-hmm. but he was a force to be reckoned with. <laughs> He was, you know, as you say, jacked up and muscled mm-hmm. and strong. And mm-hmm. he was, I, uh, he's my boy. I love <laughs> my boy. What was it like? What's it like? Um, Cause we also, um, we've had dog trainers on here as well. And uh-huh. what was it like your experience as far as him as a puppy? And did you like train him on like what kind of specific leash? Are you like a harness kind of person? Are you more of like a slip lead? Cause you know, that's a whole different uh, raging debate as well. It is um, my feeling about he. So he was um, initially trained on a slip lead, mm-hmm. actually initially on a choke chain. Mm, OK, then we went to a soft slip lead mm-hmm. and now he's on a harness. 
Wow. And um, he was um, a very, he was never aggressive, but he was a dominant dog. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't know. This is again is another huge debate, mm-hmm. neutering or not neutering. Yeah. But I neutered him at seven. Oh wow! Okay. And um, you know he he weighed more than I did, and he was a a very strong dog. And while he was well trained, the the uh, if the correct motivation was in front of him, I could not stop him. <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. Wow. To say the least. He would go into four wheel drive and off he went. Wow. Yes. Yeah. I definitely, I mean, for me, I mean, I, and I, I work out every day and yep. I'm, I'm young you and healthy. Are, I definitely you are a very fit man. Yes. So I would, I would definitely say I would probably have a tough time being be able fine. to <laughs> be fine. <laughs> well, and, just because you know, he's strong, you know, yes. and he's like, you know, cause of my, my dog, she's a little, 30 pound, the 30 pound mutt. Um, she's a puppy, but, uh, she still, yep. I mean, I'm like, dang, she's pretty strong. So I just, yep. <laughs> well, and I've handled horses all my life. Mm-hmm. So he is, he is a strong dog, but back to what I was saying, I think any way you can communicate with a dog mm-hmm. is correct. Mm-hmm. If it's through a, um, a slip lead or a harness or mm-hmm. a regular buckle on collar mm-hmm. and leash. It uh, it's to me, it's is a hundred percent about the human and the way they communicate with the dog. As yeah. long as you're communicating well. And uh, that's. And the dog doesn't, I guess, in a sense, fear you. Right. And you don't want them. You don't, I mean, no. you, you don't want them to cower. Right. You. you want them to be excited when you come home. Yes. Or, you want them you know. to be happy about doing what you want them to do. Yes. And whatever motivates them to be happy with the ultimate result. Mm-hmm. You know, to me, it's positive reinforcement. You can get behavior that you want through um, what's the term now? Negative reinforcement. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and you can get good results with that, mm-hmm. but not as good as with positive training. It takes longer. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's, and I realized, you know, I've had my dog for two years. It doesn't stop. It's every day, every day, every day. And it, and it's just reinforcing, you know, what you've learned for sure. Because if you stop, they'd become undisciplined. They'll, you know, if you're depending on your preference, like if your yep. dog will beg or get on the table or like, you know, put a stand up on their hind legs when you're like cooking food, all that stuff. So it's definitely... Yep. <laughs> yep. There, there are rules that I think it, it is uh, very beneficial. Mm-hmm. You know, I've had up to six large dogs in my house at a time. Wow. It's a zoo. Um, <laughs> it, it can be, I, I call it feeding time at the zoo. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, they need rules and they do mm-hmm. very well with rules and mm-hmm. you can tell your dog no and it's yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. A lot of people don't like that. A lot of people don't like to tell their little babies no. No, I, de- I know a couple of those people for sure. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, let's, uh, okay. Before we go, I mean, cause I could talk about my dog all day. So yep. let's get back to, uh, the next question. So how did you, how did you figure out how to get your current business up and running and, and where do you source your ingredients if you're comfortable sure. sharing? Yep. Um, so um, my background is in finance and accounting. That's what mm-hmm. I did for 30 years before I started the dog food business. Mm-hmm. And through that experience, I knew the legal and accounting steps I need to take to start a new business. The licensing with the state, how to file the reports, the payroll, all of that whole side of things I knew. Mm -hmm. Um, and I will say being on the other side of the fence, being the business owner, rather than the financial consultant coming in to tell you how to tweak your business. It's a different ball game with Mm -hmm. everything the owners have to deal with. Just a a lot of different things that I think you simply have to work through as they come to you. My sourcing, I source everything I can locally. Some things aren't grown here. You know, Mm -hmm. I I can't get local quinoa. You know, I can't get local Mm -hmm. flaxseed. And with the quantity that we're cooking and selling right now, I I have to buy in bulk. Mm. 
Um, my salmon comes from, it's ocean raised salmon off the coast of Chile that is then brought to Miami and trucked up here multiple days a week. So I get my salmon multiple days a week. My beef and chicken and lamb, the beef and chicken are sometimes local. Uh, again, with the supply chain issues, it's almost mm -hmm. impossible mm -hmm. now to get what I want from local butchers that actually have the cows and butcher them, you know, here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so what I can get here, I do what I can't I source from other areas. Cool. Awesome. Well, I, and I did not know that there was salmon off the coast of Chile. That's interesting. Yep. I, yep. They're raised in huge ocean pens. Ah, uh, okay. There used to be, you know, so the, uh, the terminology farm raised is yep. bad mm -hmm. because that conjures up the, um, you know, the four foot deep pools of, of water yeah, with that are circulating and, yeah. and the, the, you know, the fish are sick and filled with, you know, infections and bacteria yep. and that they're just not well. Yep. Um, but they have devised these enormous ocean pens. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I think it is. That's uh, like, and these pens are how big would you say? Like miles long? They're just like, I are... honestly don't know like cubic meters, mm -hmm. but they're huge. Yeah. I don't know. It's just basically, it's, it's kind of like a, not a net, but like a wall. I would say probably right. I Something do like believe that. so. Yeah. They're pens. They're yeah. big, huge, uh, water moves freely and, um, mm -hmm. you know, that's awesome. Okay. Yep. Well, cool. Um, so is there any kind of preference in general for any animal protein that you particularly prefer? Um, and if so, why? No. And I think that dogs like people need to eat a variety of foods. I think mm -hmm. it benefits their gut health. Mm -hmm. That's why when dogs have been fed a single food for a long time, and then you introduce something new, they get diarrhea. Diarrhea is simply an inflammation in the gut, in the bowels, in the intestines. Mm -hmm. And that's caused by a, uh, an issue with their gut bacteria. The gut bacteria, if you feed a single source of food, then the gut bacteria is limited. You introduce something new, they don't know what to do. You know, the little bacteria don't know how to handle things. Mm -hmm. So- massive inflammation. So a variety is good. Mm -hmm. you, um, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to ask, do you, so now, I mean, we start, we see this trend in um, the pet industry where basically we have the same stuff that we have for humans, probiotics, supplements we have for dogs. Yep. What, so this is a great segue since you already started talking about gut health. What are your thoughts on probiotics? Do you feel like they need it if they get a range of different meats or what, what's your thoughts on that? Um, I think there's definitely a use for pre and probiotics. I mm -hmm. don't actually use them with my dogs. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not against it. I just haven't necessarily had the need for it. Okay. But um, no, that's not true. I have used um, probiotics with my Ridgeback a few years ago. He got some, he, he ate some junk out in the yard and he had a massive intestinal issue and he went mm. on antibiotics for quite a long time. And I did use probiotics at that point just to help keep his gut bacteria optimal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So there's what, okay. So um, I guess that also, so talk a little bit about how, commercial dog food can cause leaky gut. So a leaky gut syndrome is where the passive barrier in the intestine has changed mm -hmm. and allows different size particles to be absorbed than should be absorbed. And that manifests itself in the dog by what you and I and most pet owners would say is an allergic response. Mm -hmm. Itchiness, um, skin issues, some diarrhea at some point, but it's all based on the size of the protein molecules that are being absorbed by the gut. And I don't know because I'm not a scientist, mm -hmm. but my understanding is that that's caused by a lot of the subpar protein mm -hmm. and what it's mixed with and how it's used in the kibble that, um, changes the structure and allows that, um, absorption. Got it. And to fix it, 
is to change the protein source to a clean, healthy, protein, full, whole protein source. And uh, also bone broth. Bone broth is an awesome thing to use. Um, probably, it, I mean, in my mind, it, it's better than probiotics. It mm. serves a different mm-hmm. purpose, but you know, I'm a, I'm a bone broth fan. I think it adds a lot to their diet and with hardly any downside at all. Mm. Do you typically, when you cook, um, cause in, if you're a meathead, uh, yep. or in, in the bodybuilding space and you're yep. trying to up your protein, yep. you cook your rice or quinoa in bone broth. Is that, is yep. that typically what you do for your, uh, for your dogs or for your recipes? Um, actually I do okay. except for, except for the lamb. Um, so we boil our proteins mm-hmm. and you know, that that's a harsh term. We gently boil, <laughs> you know, it's not a raging boil for hours, yeah, yeah. but you mm-hmm. know, it's a light boil just to cook. Mm-hmm. And then we drain the meat and we use the liquid that comes from the meat mm-hmm. to um, cook the sweet potatoes uh-huh. and the rice in. So yes, we are doing that. Cool. I, thought I didn't so. even think about it, but yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, I, uh, it's just, it's funny. Cause I, um, I am into working out and yep. I'm also, you know, trying to, because my job is at a desk most of the time. So I'm trying yep. to keep my, keep my physique and my, uh, my, yep. <laughs> my figure. So, yes, <laughs> you know, keeping my protein up is, uh, is important to me. And I found out this little hack for if anyone's listening, uh, to put, bone broth and either beef or chicken doesn't matter which one in your quinoa or rice and now you get extra oh. protein yep yep you do <laughs> and we do make bone broth um i get beef femur bones mm-hmm. and i cook them with apple cider vinegar first i roast first i boil them for 20 minutes mm-hmm. at our huge roiling boil and then mm-hmm. i drain that and then i roast the bones for 10, 15 minutes. And then I put them into a huge stock pot. I mean, we could stand in it. It's huge. Mm -hmm. And um, filled with these beef femur bones with some apple cider vinegar. And then that just barely simmers for about three days. Cool. And um, again, I'm not a scientist, Mm -hmm. but my understanding is that the apple cider vinegar leaches some of the um, calcium, chondroitin, conglo- um, glucosamine out of the bones. Mm. And it's a, it's a very natural way to boost your dog's, um, joint health. Yeah. Much, yeah. much better for them more easily metabolized than the chemical glucosamine and chondroitin supplements you can buy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and not only that, but, um, for, uh, those who are listening also, we, uh, I believe, the U S is a huge importer of supplements for humans. So mm-hmm. why would pets be any different? Right. Same, same exact thing as, and, and I think one of our biggest ones is from China. So all that stuff, all those supplements you see on the shelf in the grocery store, just all uh, questionable. <laughs> it's yeah. all questionable Yeah. because you know, the, everything that we buy that is coming in from other countries, those are produced under those country standards. Yeah. And yep. we would like to think that they meet our standards. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they don't. Yeah, uh, that, I, I guess. That, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you said that because it is true. It doesn't just because it comes from a different country doesn't mean that it's, you know, poor quality. But you have to know the standard of, mm-hmm. you know, requirements as far as cleanliness, sanita- sanitation, quality, mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and if it's subpar, then that's just what you're going to get. Exactly. Now, standards for pets are different than standards from humans. That's just the way life is, mm-hmm. yep. unfortunately. Yeah. So I guess um, our last question here is what are your, I, I know you said most of our animals are, not, they're not, they're not in the wild hunting. So right. they're mostly pet, uh, they're mostly mm-hmm. pets, if not all pets. Yep. There's some working dogs, but what is your typical guidelines or specific quantities of carbohydrates in dog food? Considering that the majority of dry dog food contains a significant amount of starches and carbohydrates. Yep. I don't think that dogs should eat corn, wheat, and soy. Okay. Most of the uh, 
I think I'm safe to say this. Most of the commercial dog food brands, those are some of the major ingredients. Now you get some of the higher quality products mm-hmm. and they're not, you know, their first few ingredients are meat, meat mm-hmm. byproducts, um, meals, which yep. I don't happen to like either, but that's, you know, another subject. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think diet dogs should be fed a diet of mostly corn, wheat, and soy. Mm-hmm. Their diet should be primarily protein. Um you know, you mentioned something else. Again, this could be a whole other podcast, but the difference of dogs between wild dogs and wild wolves and mm-hmm. our dogs now. I think that they're, and again, this is my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that their genetic turnover, the number of litters that they have during their, you know, the, the thousands of years we've been domesticating dogs. I think a wild wolf is a totally different digestive creature than the dogs that are sleeping beside me on the couch here. (laughs) You know, their digestive systems have evolved over the generations, the thousands of generations. And I think they do benefit from some of the carbohydrates that we have introduced into their diets. They don't need the, the, what I call the cereal products, the corn, wheat, and Mm -hmm. soy. But um, I think there's some value, like in our diets, we have carrots, we have kale, we have quinoa, we have sweet potatoes, Mm -hmm. and some brown rice. I think that adds a lot of value to their diets, actually. And I think they benefit from it. Yeah, no, I I definitely, um, I'm on the same page. I think it's really difficult, at least in my opinion, as far as trying to avoid carbohydrates, unless that's just what you want to do, unless you're like, all right, Right. I'm going to, I'm going to strictly do raw. Like you said, we we have dogs that pretty much, you know, they're they're just laying under our feet and kind of laying around all day, aside from the little bit of exercise. I mean, you know, I'm a fit guy, but I I don't take my dog on a run. I take her to the beach occasionally, but I try and get like three 15 minute walks, Yep. you know, a day. Right. And so I definitely am not clocking in three to four miles like you are. Right. <laughs> no, but I, but I, you know, we just go for walks. Yeah. You know, yeah. It, it's, you know, we're out and it's more, um, you know, for me, we walk, but it's more time for them to be out of the house and smelling and visiting with other dogs. And it's, yeah. it's their recreation time. Mm-hmm. It's really not their, their exercise time. Mm-hmm. Although my little Havanese, if she's keeping up with the big guys ambling, She's trotting the whole way. So she's getting her steps in. Oh, sure. let's say. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's wow. Fun. Do you do you walk them all at once? Uh, no, no. Um, I probably could now that my guy is a little older, but um, my husband can walk all three at once. It's It can be fun sometimes, um, but sometimes no, it's fun. <laughs> sometimes it's crazy. You know, it can be interesting walking three dogs at once, pulling you in different directions. Yeah, but yeah. I personally walk my ridge back alone uh, okay. because, you know, now 99 percent of the time he's awesome. But that, you know, half of one percent, he's, he's he's still a big boy. Yeah, yeah. He's still got he's got that old man strength now. <laughs> he does. And, you know, it, it's all about anticipation. Yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, um, oh, there's a squirrel over there. Let's let's go over here. <laughs> yep. Um, well, you know, I see a lot of people walking and, you know, their leash is on the end of their wrist and their cell phones in front of their face. And you can't do you know, that with him. No, it's I mean, you can you lose a dog, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You lose a dog because he's uh, he's always looking. He's always alert. Mm. So you kind of you kind of got to be that way too. My my dad's dog is actually my my dog's sister. They were litter mates. Ah, totally two different personalities. Same mannerisms, same kind of demeanor, mm-hmm. similar face. His my dog's I think she looks more like a German short haired pointer, but his is more look like like a Belgian Malinois or some kind wow, of mixed okay. hound, some hound. Yeah, yeah. But it's so funny, uh, like because my dog's not interested in like, like, for example, we, we have a, we have a property and we, he brings them both over there. And the other one, my dog is more interested in just sniffing around. His dog is obsessed with rabbits. So it's like, like Cyclops, like a, yep, just like, yep, like tractor it. beam looking for the, yep. looking for the rabbits across the, the property. Yep. <laughs> well, we used to live out in Jupiter farms. 
Oh, okay. And now I'm in Abacoa. But when we were in Jupiter Farms, my Ridgeback had an obsession with tortoises. Interesting. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's the smell or the sound or the way they just kind of plod around the ground. But he was obsessed with tortoises. <laughs> what yes. would he do when he get like get up to one? Would he try and like? Oh, yeah. Pick him up in his mouth and run around. And that's crazy. It. Run around. <laughs> um, the first one he got, he cracked the shell oh. in half. It was Dang. a huge. To- I mean, he's a big boy. Yeah. He has big teeth. Yeah. He has a strong mouth. Yeah. So this thing had to be, he, it was a big tortoise. I mean, it had to be this big around. And he got the whole thing in his mouth. And by the time I got it out of his mouth, the shell was cracked top and bottom. Oh, dang. Yeah. Uh, well, so it took him to- somewhere and we taped it up and they tell me he was all right. But still. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Good, good. <laughs> Not fun. <laughs> no, no, definitely. You're just, I, I, yeah, it's just, when like for example my my dad's dog um i don't know how it happened because there's usually no way um, his dog will catch a rabbit there's no way my dog will catch a rabbit so they have afterburners there's just no no chance right and and uh, got one he got she got one and i don't know if it was just because we were pulling up to the property at night and it may have like gotten like deer in the headlights kind of thing right. and she came just took it out out of the nowhere and she got it i think but yeah that was that was rough yeah it's kind of scary yeah 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 you're like whoa it's not <laughs> fun it, you know for us that that's not our world yeah well i i want to ask one more question just sure. cuz you know if if not everyone's able to or has access to a a service like yours how if someone were to start making if let's say they start out with homemade dog food yep how would you recommend they would uh shop for food and yep. what would you say is a great starting point as far as what they should get as far as first recipe and then learning from there okay i think that you can use a lot of different foods. A lot of people ask me this question and I would say a couple of pointers, boil your meat and drain it. Don't saute ground beef. It retains the fat. It can um, lead to pancreatitis. Hmm. Yep. It's also, you know, I think we touched, you know, off air about the uh, changes in a meat fat when you grill it or use high heat and saute it, Mm -hmm. it becomes carcinogenic. That's probably not a good thing for a dog to eat on a daily basis. So I would boil your protein and drain it. And um, then you can cook any vegetables in that broth that adds as, you know, it's, it's good for them. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say that you can use a variety of vegetables And a variety is good. You need probably need to add some calcium that can be through uh, eggshells or calcium citrate. It's always good if you don't have someone that makes the diet for you. You can go to a couple of websites like Balance IT. Mm. They can help you out or you can buy a, um, a high quality dog multivitamin that might solve some of those issues and then just create a variety in your dog's diet. They can eat squash. They can eat broccoli. They can eat green beans. We like to blanch our vegetables just slightly Mm -hmm. because dogs can't really get any nutrition from raw vegetables. They lack Mm. that um, enzyme, I think. Enzyme. enzyme. Amylase. Is it called amylase? Something. Anyway, they lack an enzyme in their digestive system to get the nutrients out of raw vegetables. So we blanch it slightly. Um, But a good multivitamin is kind of a fail safe if you want to start cooking. Got it. Yep. Cool. Well, that was great advice. Always the best, best quality you can buy. Don't get the seconds. Don't get the junk. Buy the best you can buy. Whatever. Well, I used to say whatever you would feed yourself, but people tend to feed themselves a lot of junk too. So buy the best food you can buy and then cook for your dog. Yeah. Well, that was great. Um, I think that'll help our listeners for sure. Well, that was a, this was a great conversation. I really, really enjoyed your insight and, um, you know, just coming from experience. Why don't you tell our audience and listeners where they can find out about you as far as social media or website. Yep. We have a website. It is loveandbold.com. That's L-O-V-I-N-B-O-W-L.com. 
And we're on Facebook and Instagram, not Twitter yet, working on that one. <laughs> and um, we use all human grade, high quality ingredients. We cook every single day of the week. Well, great. Great having you, Janet. It was a uh... Awesome. Like I said, awesome conversation. And you guys go ahead and check that out. Check out her uh, her website and check out her, uh, her social media. And um, with that, I hope you have a guys have a great day and we'll talk to you soon.